come to seek for your forgiveness. If we have followed the crowd doing as others did, forgetting that we are pledged to follow you, then Good Shepherd, set us right. If we have chosen to do what we want, rather than act out of love for others, and have found ourselves in difficulties, then Good Shepherd, set us right. If we have been so preoccupied with other things, that we have stopped listening to the voice of the Good Shepherd, then, Good Shepherd, set us right. Bring us back from where we have wandered, and set our feet on the path that leads to life. Speak your word of pardon, Lord, and remind us that you said, I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. May each of us know that we matter to you, however far we may have strayed. May we hear your voice afresh during our service today, and draw closer to you before we leave. May we entrust the week ahead to you, and have the courage to follow you day by day. For we pray these things in your name. And now we join our voices together in the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power and the glory for ever. Amen.
Our next hymn this morning is The Lord's My Shepherd, hymn 14.
The metaphor of the Good Shepherd is one we're all familiar with. It's come down through the centuries of tradition and made complete sense to those who grew up in agricultural societies. These days we're more removed from the work of farmers and shepherds and the importance of livestock is lost on many who have never spent time in the countryside. Here in East Newk, you'll probably still have many stronger connections with agriculture, especially arable farming. However, there are relatively few sheep farms in the area in comparison to other places. Now I have a little insight into this world as I had an Irish uncle, not, a, not one of those imaginary ones that everyone seems to have, I had a real Irish uncle um, from Donegal, but he was a shepherd in the hills above Stirling. And visits to the farm when I was a youngster were filled with excitement, but also quite a lot of trepidation, because we were allowed to run wild and do far more than a town boy like myself in the 1970s normally got away with. I have to also confess that my uncle seems to be the exact opposite of the good shepherds that we see in the Gospels. He was a rough and ready man with massive hands and a temper to match. The thought of him laying down his life for his sheep seemed unlikely. But in many ways he probably did have exactly the same sense of sacrifice for his flock as we read of in the Bible. The sheep and the farm were his life as well as his livelihood. And even today, farming is a tough life not to be taken on half-heartedly or on a whim. But there is a huge difference between the type of shepherd my uncle was and those from the Middle East, even today, but especially in biblical times. Firstly, the shepherd that Jesus was talking about led his sheep rather than driving them. In today's farming, we're used to seeing the shepherd with his, with his or her dogs driving the sheep, guiding them from behind and putting them into a field or a pen within the confines of the farm. In Jesus' day, the shepherd led the flock across the hillsides from, to find fresh, fresh pasture and water. They were known to their sheep by their voice and the sheep would respond when they called. The life of the shepherd was itinerant, precarious and rough. They were responsible to the owner of the flock for their welfare, and if a sheep was killed by a wild animal or stolen by thieves, the shepherd had to prove that he had done his best to save the animal. Laying down your life for the flock seems extreme, but remember that Israel's greatest king, King David, had once been a shepherd boy and had fought both a lion and a bear to save his sheep. By contrast, Jesus reminds his listeners that the hired hand will never have that same level of care or of sacrifice for the flock. If you're only being paid by the other, why would you put your life on the line? The good shepherd at night time is lay across the entrance to the pen in order to stop the sheep from leaving or animals or intruders getting in. In taking on the mantle of the new shepherd, Jesus was identifying himself with the shepherd who was committed to his flock. Where others would talk a good game, make it sound like they might be committed, but not actually of the courage of their commitments. Jesus delivered on every level. He literally gave up his life for his sheep. You heard this morning 
in our first of the three meetings. My apologies, you had so many meetings this morning. A continuation of the story of Peter and John and the healing in the temple. And so today that reading comes to a head. Peter and John were arrested after they healed the beggar man. They were stopped in the middle of their preaching. But we are told that the impact they had was so great that 5,000 people came to the faith that day. So the two temples that we heard are brought before the temple had two, two disciples, not two temples. That would be another thing entirely, please don't go there. The two disciples are brought before the temple hierarchy. No doubt, all of them surrounded. You remember when elders used to sit up on the dais, all in their, their frock coats? And uh, you know, I, I, I was, when I was a boy, I was once at a church where elders had frock coats and top hats. Uh, and, and it's like, like having 12 judges around you. Well, the temple authorities would be like that, maybe not the top hats, but the equivalent 2,000 years ago. Peter and John would be down at the front somewhere. They would be above, literally as well as metaphorically, and the disciples below, being looked down on. Temple authorities would have exuded as much power and authority as they could muster. And for most of us, that would be more than enough to, uh, for us to cower down and beg forgiveness for our temerity in challenging the authority of the temple and the Sadducees. They, after all, were the uh, religious elite, almost literally one step below God in their importance in the eyes of most Jews, and certainly in their own estimation of themselves. What follows in the book of Acts is what E.M. Whitlock in his commentary calls a gem of concentrated evangelism. Peter's defence is beautifully summarised by Luke. Whether it is a word for word account seems unlikely because it is so short. But it encapsulates so much of what Peter would go on and preach about in the years to come. It is more likely that Peter's speech before the Sanhedrin lasted longer, but its power was what was so effective. For a fisherman from Galilee to stand before the most powerful body in Judaism and speak with such authority was unprecedented. We can tell this by the way the Sanhedrin reacted, going into closed session and then demanding that Peter and John go away quietly. We know, of course, the disciples did the exact opposite. And they went out full of the courage of the Holy Spirit and continued to preach in Jesus' name. The courage Jesus spoke of was in full display in the actions of the early Christian community. They needed to have a good shepherd leading them forward. And through the Holy Spirit, they had the voice of Jesus as their guide. That guide was doing so not just as a demanding owner might, but as the loving shepherd, willing to give up his own life that they may, might have a full life. Courage. Is that indefinable quality that many find within themselves in the most difficult of circumstances? For the early Christians, sur surrounded by hostility from the Jew Jewish authorities on the one hand and the Roman overlords on the other, they required all the courage they could be given. For us, the courage that we require is less obvious, less threatening. But we still need courage to speak truth to power, to represent our faith to the world, a world that rarely sees our faith, faith as a threat 
but more of a distraction. When we proclaim our faith, we must do so with love, with the care and the humility of the shepherds, and with compassion. But we must also be courageous and willing to take the knocks that come our way. There is no greater example of how to do that than from the book of Acts and the letters of the disciples. We see time and time again them meeting with opposition and how they stood courageously for their faith despite all they faced. So when the time comes for us to give our account to God of what we did for our faith, will we be able to stand before God and claim that we followed the Good Shepherd? Or will we shrink away because we lacked the courage of our convictions? Amen. And may God add his blessing to these words. Our next hymn is 461. How sweet the sound of Jesus, the name of Jesus sounds. Accept these offerings we bring to you 
in a whole variety of ways. Grant that they may go where we can't go, that they may reach where we can't reach, that they may do what we cannot do. Use them to strengthen your church and advance your kingdom here where we are and far beyond. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Eternal God, as Jesus and the early church care for those in need, we pray for all who suffer and are not cared for, or whom care cannot reach. We pray for the elderly who die alone, the young who are neglected or cruelly treated, young and old whose weaknesses are exploited and sensitivities abused. We pray for all who have grown hopeless and weary as each day is like the last. For those who face hunger and hopelessness with no way out. Refugees from war and violence to whom no one wants to give a home. To those whose lives have been wrecked by conflicts they do not understand and cannot affect or change. Those who are handed by economic and political forces or by the impact of climate change, which take no account of their need. In this world of so much suffering, we pray too for all who are affluent, comfortable, warm and cared for, those who do not care. For those who know what they should do but do not bother. For those who close their eyes and minds and those who simply find other people's troubles and needs a cross they do not wish to bear. We pray for those who do care, those who accept the pain and disturbance that knowledge brings, but do not see what they can do. Those whose consciences hurt, who want to help but cannot see how. We pray for all who care, who are willing to go the extra mile time and again, often at cost in so many ways. For those who go where trouble, pain and poverty are, risking life and limb, facing, facing danger and fear. Father, as we pray, increase the depth of love in us and in others who have something to give to the ill the troubled and dying. Give us such love that your sheep, both inside and outside the fold, may be found, given health, strength, food, and the ability to enjoy, enjoy life to the full and the joy to praise you. We thank you that Jesus is the Good Shepherd and for your grace and mercy that has made us part of his flock. Thank you that you watch over your flock. You know us by name. You understand what we are like. You call us to follow. And you accept your company and accompany us along the path, seeking us out when we stray, keeping a loving eye on what we do. Lead us into the, our future on the adventure of faith. For Jesus' sake, we ask these things. Amen. <clears throat> so appropriately, our closing hymn this morning is in 511. Your hand, O oh God, has guided.
Give peace of the running way to you. Give peace of the flowing air to you. Give peace of the quiet earth to you. Give peace of the shining stars to you. And give peace of the infinite peace to each of you. The blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with each one, now and forevermore. Amen.